Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, slide one. There are seven slides for ten minutes. The traditionalists amongst you will recognise the importance of that. Slide one shows the distribution of physiology apartments in the UK and Ireland 20 years, a ta 20 years ago, taken from the Grey Book, whose passing is rather sad. Uh, it's not entirely accurate. Some are called physiology, some are called physiological sciences, some farm phys, and so on and so forth. But the point is, as far as I can tell, and it's not 100% accurate, I'm sure, there are no physiology departments in the UK today. A couple in Ireland, but none in the UK. So obviously, I welcome that. So what's happened to them? Either they've disappeared, or there have been mergers, or there's been what I'll call wholesale reconfiguration. And in Manchester, we took the latter route. And I want to explain why this was good for the nation, Good for Manchester and good for physiology. So let me begin, begin with a bit of history. Uh, some of this is inevitably personal, but this is the only way I think I can attack this sort of uh, debate. In 1979, I took up my chair of physiology in the University of Manchester. The head of the department said, you've got 10 years to build up your research, and then you can take over when I retire. One year later, he took leave of absence, this was 1980, and so I became head of the Department of Physiology. And I went along to the annual meeting of heads of departments to discuss the allocation of capital funds for equipment. I'm going to exaggerate to make the point, those who know me will inevitably expect that, but it was a big round table, and the professor of physics said, well, we really need another bowl for the General Bank Observatory. It's about two million. And the sort of chemist would say, okay. And everybody else looked stunned. Then the, then the, the chemist would say, well, we need a 9.2 Tesla NMR machine. And the physicist would say, okay. And then I thought, well, can I have a water bath, please? Oh, no, 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 no. So at the tender age of 36, I thought, shucks, big is beautiful. Anyway, I thought, well, I've only done this for a year, that's all right, but never mind. But then we had the cuts of 81. Margaret Thatcher, some of you will remember, and she dealt a pretty drastic blow to the universities, nothing like the one you're facing now, it has to be agreed, but at the time it seemed quite difficult. And all the senior professors took retirement including the Professor of Physiology. So I was head of school, for, head of department for more or less forever. And so I think the point is here that what do you do about this? What do you do about this? And I think we were very fortunate that a lot of the balls were in the air, the four young professors, a new vice chancellor who happened to be a biologist, and we came up with the idea of what I'll describe in a minute, which is a reconfiguration of biological sciences. Anyway, to cut a long story short, that's basically what happened. So that before 1986, when I arrived, we had these departments of biology in the Faculty of Medicine, these departments of biology in the Faculty of Science, and in 1986, as a result of our efforts, we produced a school of biological sciences with those four departments. In 1990, the school was made a faculty of the university, with faculty status, which financially is a very important thing, um, and I was dean at the time. And it makes a big difference to have a dean who's a physiologist, I suppose. I don't really know. Anyway, we went through that way, and the first thing I did was get rid of physiological sciences. So in 1990, we formed a single department school of biological sciences, of which I happen to be the dean, with lots of other people, of course, helping. And that's the way it stayed until 2004, when, as probably most of you know, the University of Manchester and UMIS merged, and that's basically what the present Faculty of Life Science comprises. I suppose you could say it's about 70% what was the School of Biological Sciences and a, a little bit of, of these other smaller parts. Bio molecular Sciences is about 20%, and then perhaps 
the five and ten percent for the other two. And that's where we are now. So the current profile is roughly like this. It's one of four faculties in the university. We still have somebody at the top table. There are about 12 research groups organized in a sort of sensible way with, with in, in various ways, but we won't need to go into that in, in great detail. We have a resource of about 75 million, of which, of course, 30-odd is research grants. So there are 240 staff, 285 research staff, and as you can see, somewhere in the region of 400 PhD students. And we're all in brand new buildings. And if you've been to Manchester, I think you'll find that they are quite impressive. Not that's the most important thing, but we're at the top table. Makes a difference. So why is this important? I think there are two reasons. I only want two. I won't spend too long. One is the PhD students. 400 PhD students, 400 PhD students is a fantastic grouping for two reasons. One, we can actually help them to become mature scientists in a way that I wasn't helped when I was young. that. It was different in, 19, in 18th century, whatever it was. But now we need to do this because these guys need some of the skills they can't get simply by experimenting at the bench. And I think that's, everybody recognizes that. It's also important for a much more selfish reason. If you've got PhD students, as I have, and you want to know who's looking at toenail growth in an aardvark or something like that, you just ask your PhD student because they all know each other. It's the most effective communication system, beats email until cocktail. So I think that a large number of PhD students, on whom, let's face it, uh, the future depends, is a very helpful thing. The other thing, of course, and I quote from Richard Naftalin here, who was just about to demolish me in a moment or two, research facilities. In his recent article in Physiology News, Richard said, quite correctly, Physiology has always been totally promiscuous in adopting any and every method that is appropriate towards elucidation of living processes. He's dead right. We've got them. More or less anything that you want, we have it. These are some of the perhaps more obvious things. I, it's no way a department of physiology could provide you with these resources. The next slide shows you that Education at Manchester is not doing too badly either. This is a sort of summary taken by Peter Brown, who's been looking after the physiology program for the last 10 or 12 years. We take in about 15 students, we lose a couple, we gain six. And of course, we have some pharmacology and physiology students. Again, uh, we, we have somewhere in the region of 15 or 20. Then we have intercalating students, intercalating medical students, and these two together that is to say uh, 19, is about a third or a little bit more of the total intercalating medical students. So each year we're graduating in the region of 50 to 60 physiologists. I think that's quite helpful for the future of physiology. But it's not just physiology students, and of course this is not unique to Manchester. We have a degree in biomedical sciences with about 80 students a year. And of the units that they study in their final year, uh, they study five. Three of these in the top are physiology, and the other one's in immunology, which I regard as physiology anyway, and bioethics for reasons best known to them. Uh, so I think it's fair to say that perhaps physiology hasn't, su hasn't survived quite so well in other places. The old universities, and this is, excuse the sort of simple terminology here, of those that were on that first slide, then... Actually, there's only a dozen who are able to offer a course in physiology or analyze a similar thing. No longer available at those places. <laughs> I do realize that I was external examiner at three of those, so whether that's got any connection, I don't really know. But anyway, uh, no longer available at some fairly senior places. But it is now available, of course, at the new universities since nature abhors a vacuum. So physiology is doing okay in terms of training in the universities, not doing so very well here. So in conclusion, Mr. Chairman, I see you approaching. My guiding principle has always been and remains every threat represents an opportunity. We need to look forwards, not backwards, to be adventurous, not reactionary. In the early 80s, 
when I was allowed, the economic climate and the changing face of the biosciences clearly indicated to those looking forward that a major reconfiguration of university biosciences was demanded. Sadly, in my view, such vision was lacking in many of our universities. And as a consequence, physiology suffered. So that in some of our major universities, it's very difficult to find. You go on the website, as I did. So, we face a bigger challenge now than we did in the 80s, the cuts of 81, as I recall them. We should be thinking laterally and not navel-gazing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. And now I ask Giovanni Mann from King's College London to oppose the motion. Gio? Cheers. Well, here we go. I think Maynard has opened most doors for me, so I feel quite relaxed and I don't have to put on such a show. What I think is really important, is there a laser here? There is, I think. What I'd really like to start with is this down here, the Physiological Society, Education and Research. That's what we're about. That's what I wear this badge for. That's where I was born. I was, did my physiology PhD at UCL, and I had the privilege of sitting with Bernard Katz, Ricardo Milady, and Andrew Huxley. Uh, many may not have, but I had that privilege, and I used to have tea with them, and I met others. Is the mic on? Actually, I'll try. Try that. Can you hear me now, Roger? Good. Uh, so that's where I started. But what I'd like to look at is we've just had the little scenario from Maynard Biomedical Sciences, Manchester, fantastic, amalgamation, fantastic. I share with him every view that he has. The ship has set sail. I'm on his ship, and I'll probably on, be on Ian's, as most of us are. We're not going to change that ship. So we're into integrated biosciences. But the premise that I'd like to bring back is the physiology academic concept. I use the word department. I don't worry about departments. King's, by the way, has a department of physiology. We have a head wherever Jeremy is sitting. He still is our head of physiology. But we're virtual. But we deliver an academic discipline to different things. I wouldn't know if Jeremy agrees to that, because he hires research active staff to join the physiology staff. The important, if you want to interject, please feel free. The important thing is that with the academic concept, what we're doing in all our old and new universities is hopefully training up BSCs, intercalated BSCs, MSCs, and PhDs. This ATP is the introduction from Richard Nafklin. It's an expenditure of bloody energy in training these students, all right? And when we have these, we have an int intensive research training scheme. So if you were within the academe of physiology, you're fitting, as you'll see in my last concluding slide, the BBSRC remit. What are we going to do to train integrative biologists or physiologists or pharmacologists? We cannot take them out over here into this system, which is biomedical sciences. And what I'd like to show you over here, these are research divisions, as you pointed out. I sit in a very strong and powerful cardiovascular research division. They're cardiologists, they're vascular biologists. Some, but not all, may know what the kidney does, and that's a worry for me. Some, but not all, may know what the oxygen tension is in the coronary artery. Some may not. And the difficulty of training our PhDs without a physiology academic environment and simply in research divisions leads to very reductionist ways of thinking. So when you open them up to a BSc fellowship, from the BBSRC, rather, I meant to say, what are they going to do? Are they going to be with Maynard in his deanery, with his money and his equipment and building great things and bringing in the profs? Or are they actually going to be training young scientists like most of you in the audience, I hope, see the future of gaining techniques? And my question and premise is, what are you going to do when you have a question about the ARCVARD? Yes, as PhD students or postdocs, you'll move to your colleagues and ask, but you're not in an environment where one research division communicates with another because we're competing enterprises for the budget. If you're creative, you can move through the different research divisions, as I did at the IOP just two days ago, and got someone in MRI imaging to say, that's a good idea, Giovanni, we'll do it. 
and fund it. But it takes, you have to move. It isn't free. I'm not saying physiology, as you said, Maynard, needs to sit in an academic department. We're all together, the renal physiologist, the respiratory, the cardiovascular, but we have to have a training profile. Second thing that I'd like to bring up, these dotted lines now are no longer our financial input is no longer, that's why they're dotted, going to physiology academic departments. At King's, you're right. We could be seen as a teaching department because the money and my salary is no longer with Jeremy Ward. It sits with Ajay Shah, my director of research. Every teaching I do, all that money flows to him. So we don't have funding for physiologists. What that does is limits our training of these students. I can't take my student and say, can you go to this lab and understand what the glomerulus does because it's important in the concept of what the mesangial cell will do. Because they haven't got a clue what a kidney is. Because they've been patching a single cell. That's the missing link. Now, for my esteemed colleague here, I turn to Glasgow. I take this from Richard. This was Glasgow in 1978. There could be some errors in that. This is Glasgow today. People that call themselves physiologists. Who knows whether they're phy physiologists or not, but we're here today, I believe, in something called the Physiological Society. And I've got severance papers for Philip Wright. I've got bills going to Maynard and to Ian, because if the Physiological Society can't deliver teaching and research and maintain the discipline, we're lost. This is Glasgow Life Sciences, so it could be Manchester. I could have done King's, but I thought that would be putting too much. You can see huge number of scientists, great integration. Everyone talks to everyone, and we're really successful. Uh, I beg to differ. This is what I got from one of our colleagues at the FISOC about the actual membership in the Gray Book or on the web of physiologists. Unfortunately, I can't tell you how many are young. Look here at zero, clearly, but where's Manchester, because I'm blind? Here we are, you're doing quite well, Maynard. There seem to be a lot of physiologists in your enterprise. <laughs> and this is what I'd like to end with, and I don't want you to read it all, but this was the recent BBSRC call for integrative biology. There are a few centers. Read the red sentence. A red, a recent survey of UK higher education institutes revealed the emergence of a skills gap in mammalian biology thought to be caused by a decline in animal physiology education. And with that, I rest my case. Because if you're not going to have animal education, the whole body, the whole organism, to integrate the genome, the cell, what have you, into the organism, what are you going to do, Maynard, with your deanery and your great equipment funding at Manchester? Nothing. Because we're coming back to the genome to actually address this issue. And if you want money from the BBSRC Maynard in Manchester, and I believe you're actually part of it, there you go, look at that. You are doing something with Liverpool, but you're integrating physiology. I'm not for going back in time to have a physiology department, no. Whether it be at Oxford or Cambridge or UCL, not necessary. What I'm after is that we have physiology education and training so that a student, a medical student, a BSc student, an MSc and a PhD can actually understand at Viva or when they're giving a communication and they're asked about something, what does the intestine do? Or oh, is that that thing that sort of flows along there? Are there really transporters and glutes on both sides? What, are they different? Why are they different? Or someone that works in the retina, can they actually understand beyond light and rods and cones? And I think that that's the issue of that. So what do we need to think about? One is, I think, certainly for kings, at least, physiology is key for ensuring transfer of academic and research skills for our new staff. We're appointing them day and night, whether into research divisions or not. We need teaching to medical, biomedical, pharmacy, nutrition. But it needs a broad-based training in physiology. We need systems-based research in vivo. And again, we need broad-based training to ensure translation of reductionist research. We need to invigorate physiology practicals, conceptual things. How do you do certain experiments? There are no experiments being done anymore. We have no money. Can we set up select courses? And we need to help little Jeremy Ward, my head of physiology, to support innovative and recuperative training for new staff. There he sits with a physiology staff of about 25, distributed into divisions of research, pumping out for the REF, but when it comes to actually training and disseminating physiology, there were the difficulty. And finally, 
I'd like to have re-entry fellowships and funding for that for our gender balance because clearly female scientists in our audience are having a rough deal in my view because all the funding we used to have to bring you back in is being taken away maybe not just given to the deaneries but we need to strengthen physiology and with that I rest my case. Thanks very much, Giovanni. So our next speaker to second the motion is Ian McGrath, who is one of the few names on the Glasgow list up there, both in the Paleolithic age and this one. So. Well, my thanks go to uh, both uh, Maynard and Giovanni for supporting the proposition. <laughs> when, uh, when I'm stuck, stuck is where to start, uh, I always go to the dictionary. So I looked up physiology, separate, and discipline. So discipline first. Noun, punishment or chastisement. <laughs> I thought, oh, no, it's not the AGM. <laughs> if you've been an officer of this society, that's what the AGM is. Separate, adjective. Kept apart, existing independently. That seems clear. That's what we're debating. And in physiology, noun, study of how organisms work. Well, that's fine, but there's an awful lot of organisms. So we might get into difficulty there. So the question is, can we study how organisms work? Can the study of how organisms work be kept apart from other fields of study? What are these other fields of study that it could be kept apart from? So this, I think, is a dilemma that physiology has faced as it has evolved over the 130 years or so that it's been, it's been going. It falls between two stools, biology and medicine. And it doesn't fully embrace or is embraced by either of them. And that's our problem. We're stuck in the middle. We fall between these two stools. At one time, much of our physiology was based in medicine. My own Regius chair started as the chair of the Institutes of Medicine. And it went on to be called the chair of the theory of physic. Before, in 1876, physiology became the catchphrase. Now, my predecessor as Regius professor, Otto Hutter, I don't know if Otto's here, he usually attends those occasions. Otto was the first non-medic to hold the Regis chair. And even then, there was a parallel chair held by a medic, Ian Boyd. The department that I entered, that you saw there in 1971, or whatever it was, in the early 70s, was the staff were just changing at that point from being almost entirely medics to scientists coming in in the course of the 1960s. Now I operate in a school, you saw that there, which has no medics on the staff, although we do still teach medical students. And incidentally, we do still have a physiology degree. You missed that off on your, on your slide. But at that time, things were very different. Uh, when I was an undergraduate, the professor was the predecessor to Otto, who was uh, Robert Campbell Gary. He was old school. When the department started to take in science students to the BSc, they didn't tell him because he wouldn't have approved and he was only a couple of years off retiral. So no science students actually came into the department until the very late 1960s. It was entirely based in medicine in Glasgow at that point, and I dare say in a lot of other places that was similar, similar types of universities. And at that time, physiology had a key place. Maynard mentioned having your feet under the table. Well, at that time, the professors of physiology and biochemistry, to a man, yes, they were all men, had their feet under the big table in the university and could get resources. But what's happened to medicine since? We've gone over to PBL. There is no preclinical medical course anymore. They've all got stethoscopes from the minute they enter university. They're all supposed to be thinking integratively but without any scientific basis at the beginning. 
During that time, also, science has grown hugely. There weren't all that many subjects of science you could study when I was an undergraduate. There was a very small selection. But it's grown hugely. And the nature of science has changed. So where has physiology ended up amongst us? Are the biochemists not doing physiology? Are the molecular geneticists not doing physiology? Are the pharmacologists not finding out things about pharmacology as they use drugs? Of course they are. All this is obvious, and we shouldn't be separate, separate from them. If you look at the program of this meeting, look at the departmental addresses of the speakers. There are cell biologists, molecular this and that, even biochemists, God help us. They are all doing physiology, which is why they've been invited here by a society that many of them would never have thought of joining or attending their meetings. But when we invite them to the meetings, they come along, they give their talks, and we think it's great, and they think it's great. So it has to be the same on the organizational level. The important thing is to find ways within science and medicine to highlight the importance of integrated systems and the methods for studying them. This struck me, I'll just give two little anecdotes. This struck me two years ago first when Wellcome hosted a day on systems biology to teach us all how we could get grants from the research councils in systems biology. And one of the speakers outlined the similarities between the organization of intracellular networks and cell phone networks which I don't think I really got it. But he got very excited about key points in the network that he called receptors. He discovered that in biology there were these things in the outside of cells which were a key integrative point. He was very excited. This week, a colleague called me from the States to say he's on an NIH committee to devise a strategy for systems pharmacology. And the systems biologists in this group became very excited when they discovered the kind of things that used to be done with guinea pig ileum. And they want the United States to develop a strategy for education where that kind of biology can be brought inside uh, alongside what they're teaching at the moment. So I think we have an opportunity now that we can create an intelligent reintegration of biology which can also support medicine. So I say to you, be a Trojan horse for physiology. And the society should be thinking how it can people achieve this, not how to keep physiology separate. I commend the motion to the meeting. Thank you. And the final voice is Richard Naftalin, also from King's College London, who's going to oppose the motion. What have you done to this? Good afternoon. As physiologists, we all know that there are many ways of skinning a cat. That's the end. As physiologists, we all know that there are many ways of skinning a cat. <laughs> However, don't ask any of our students in the last 10 years to try, because the likelihood is they'll make a pig's ear of it. Why is that? <laughs> well, the first thing is that there is a skills gap in UK. Uh, in, in vivo sciences, is there a pointer? Uh, oh, right. There's a skills gap which has been recognized by many uh, in in vivo sciences and supporting animal technologies. There are other skills gaps, but uh, we are primarily concerned with this one. Why is that? What has changed in the last 10, 15 years to make a, such a difference? About 75% of the employers who would employ in vivo uh, physiologists say uh, that there just aren't any in coming through the British universities and they have to go abroad uh, to find their personnel. Now, what are the reasons for this? Well, uh, there are several reasons. Shift from curricular towards molecular biology, changing attitudes towards animal usage. We all know about that. 
A doubling of the staff-student ratios, we know about that too, and the high cost of animal training, and we know about that. And this significant number of academics amongst us here who really believe that animal experimentation is not appropriate in teaching undergraduates. This is particularly evident in schools of life sciences where there is no niche for the position of physiologists. We have moved out of our niche position as animal physiologists and moved into the general uh, amalgam of cell biologists, molecular biologists, biologists. So we are competing with all these guys for the resource which uh, at one time, because of our niche position, was ours for the taking. So it has been taken away from us. Now there's another problem. Basically, as research scientists, we are all reductionists. And we tend to view things through the narrow, narrow perspective of our own particular line of research. However, we have to teach uh, integrative physiology. So we're moving, our research takes us away from uh, integration towards reductionism, and yet we're unable to communicate with other physiologists now because uh, we're in this mass of uh, biologists. So this uh, uh, integration, which did play, take place in physiology departments because we were all there together, is no longer there. We're no longer a group of identifiable physiologists. We are now in a mass of cell biologists frankly. Okay, so this is a, a clear problem, and somehow or other we've got to amend it. There has been a loss of our capacity to teach in vivo skills because of this. Okay, so the consequences of these things are that uh, we have no longer able to defend our position as animal experimentalists because uh, fundamentally everybody's against it. Uh, our colleagues are against it, the administration is against it, the public's against it, the students are against it, and worst, even we are against it. This is particularly the case in medical schools where the competition for clinical, from clinical uh, colleagues for a resource is greater because they have sharper elbows, frankly, and <laughs> they have greater leverage from the administrative structures. If you work in a hospital, all the administration are in bed with the clinicians. Sometimes... <laughs> okay. Uh, well, not all of them. Uh, but okay, but the question is, how are we going to regain our position uh, of a of uh, physiologists teaching the skills of in vivo uh, experimentation. How can we gain or regain a vertebral column or even a notochord? <laughs> in joke. <laughs> okay, we have to recognize that there's a problem, first of all. And the problem is that we don't teach practical physiology. We have to recognize that these changes are not inevitable. Maynard has suggested that uh, all the departments of physiology in the UK uh, have disappeared. And uh, actually, uh, he celebrates this. I mourn it. Uh, however, one has to ask oneself, has this happened in a, singular, a single time? No. There have been several departments which have resisted this change. Oxford, Cambridge, and Liverpool until very recently. Why was that? Because... These departments uh, had leaders and a leadership who had significant strength. They had, uh, they had social capital, as uh, the, the sociologist Pierre uh, Bourdieu would say. We had, in these departments, people who had respect they could face down the managerial wave. The rest of us haven't been in this happy position 
to resist the ongoing wave. We need to get a backbone. We need to be able to resist these forces which will otherwise destroy us. Okay, now here's the solution. Uh, the David Willits, grown, uh, Minister of State for Universities and Science, highlights the Society of Biology's degree accreditation program as a key to driving up the standards of higher education in the Guardian Higher Education Summit. Okay, we should use Mr. Willits as a lever to recruit and retain, uh, to obtain money to recruit and retain staff with the appropriate skills to teach and supervise in vivo experimentation. And this, we, I suggest, should be supported by the Physiological Society, and of course it is already being supported by the Society of Biology. And we should work through the accreditation system to force up the standards. They already say that we are not teaching adequately uh, in practical physiology. Well, we can force them, uh, or we can force our own administrations to obey, just as the medicals uh, use the GMC to force their curricular activity on a on us, we could use the accreditation system to say we need practical physiology. And that is what I have to say. <laughs>